Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum. Uh, we're really excited to have you here on Zoom. I see I still have my mask marks on because I'm in the back of the clinic having worn a mask all day. Uh, so uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here for a, a variety of different topics. And we have some fabulous guest speakers uh, this evening. I think you're going to really enjoy uh, tonight's meeting. Um, you can see Melody Galu, who organizes the forum, is there waving at you. And uh, the next forum is scheduled for June 16th. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology's update in breast cancer at that time. Uh, and then uh, also these are recorded, as you know, and uh, Melody will put the link in the uh, chat box. You'll be able to see that. Um, and she's listed the next forum, which will stay up. So that will be really great. Uh, the, uh, the recordings, I think, are helpful, too, because you can access them online now. So that's great. Um, we are always interested in your thoughts, so definitely send us any suggestions for areas that you'd like to cover in future forums. Uh, and uh, again, I think the ASCO update will be really uh, very interesting this year. There's a lot of data that's being presented that I think you'll find intriguing. Um, and then during the session itself, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to put in questions and we will answer them either live or by writing back. Uh, and that works really well, actually, because it allows us to have a great conversation as we're going along through here. Also, as you know, uh, Melody uses email as a way to uh, let you know about future forums and give you the link. Um, if you have friends, call, uh, other patients you know of, et cetera, who don't have the link and aren't on our mailing list, please feel free to send their email addresses to Melody and we can put them on the list if they're interested. We like to reach as many people as we can, and this is an open and free forum that means to address your uh, questions and, um, and keep you all updated to the best that we possibly can. So today we have uh, uh, some great uh, speakers and participants. Uh, I'm Hope Rugo, breast medical oncologist at UCSF. I have with me uh, today, and I'll go from the breast side to the non-breast side, but uh, we have uh, Natalie Marshall, uh, who's one of our breast medical oncologists, who runs the uh, new, less than, it's not so new now, but new-ish uh, breast oncology clinic in uh, Berkeley, uh, which is a UCSF uh, extension. So that's been great, and we love working with Natalie. She also has a half-day clinic here at the Cancer Center in San Francisco on Monday afternoons. Uh, Laura Hubbard is our Senior Breast Oncology Fellow uh, and has done a huge amount of work and research in the breast cancer and is focusing on this for her career, works with us in clinic. Uh, Michael Alvarado is one of our Senior Breast Cancer Surgeons. Uh, many of you know him. Uh, and uh, he has uh, been doing, has done a lot of different work on various areas, two areas of note, um, our intraoperative radiation therapy and looking at different uh, genomic scores as risk factors for DCIS, among other areas. Uh, Teresa Chan is one of our senior breast surgery fellows, um, already a, a boarded breast surgeon and uh, focusing on breast surgery uh, to learn more about this area and be able to work in uh, breast surgery with a specialty training. And then we're very excited to have Dr. Shagan Aurora with us. Uh, Dr. Aurora actually works in hematologic malignancies, but uh, she's been within our division of hematology, oncology, and cancer center, our go-to person in the area of, breast can of uh, COVID vaccines. Um, and since vaccines are all on the top of our mind right now and in news, uh, as we are in this pattern of where it seems to be slower than we'd like recovery from COVID, um, I thought this would be a great area. It comes up as a question uh, continuously in clinic. Um, and so we're really excited that uh, Dr. Aurora had time today, was willing to donate her time to talk to us a little bit about this area where she has a lot of expertise. So think of your questions, put them into the Q&A, and we'll look forward to our uh, evening. So we'll start actually with Dr. Aurora, who will share some slides and uh, start asking, talking to us a little bit about vaccines uh, and uh, COVID-19. You're on mute. Uh, there you Thank go. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. And you can. can see my slides as well? Uh, indeed, we can. 
Wonderful. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you tonight and especially to Dr. Rubel. Um, I look forward to discussing with all of you about COVID-19 vaccinations and especially in the setting of solid organ tumors. I'm going to start today just to show you where we were and where we are now in the world of COVID infection. I'd like to show you here in the middle of the screen, thankfully at UCSF, we currently have a very small number of patients admitted who have COVID infection. This number is, has substantially decreased over the many months. And on the left side in this box over here, you can see how the symptomatic, which is this top bright, bright orange line of rate of infection has decreased as has the asymptomatic testing rate. So these are people who come to our clinics who are asymptomatic and get tested for say procedures or such. That rate of infection is less than 1% now, which is really what our goal is. Of course, our goal is 0%, but this is much better than what it was a few months ago. And the symptomatic rate is at a pretty low rate now at UCSF of 4.9%. So the rates of infection have clearly decreased. Our numbers down, which is great. We have a vaccine, we have many vaccines, which is great. And our most vulnerable population are mostly vaccinated or at least eligible for the vaccination, which includes many of you in the audience. So what about the efficacy of the vaccine in this population of patients, namely the group of patients we all care for and those of you in the audience? I wanted to read this. Vaccines have promised to the rest of the world a return to a semblance of normal life. The ones currently cleared for use against the coronavirus are, by all accounts, extraordinary, but they were not designed for or text tested extensively on immunocompromised or immunosuppressed individuals whose immune systems have been said due, due to underlying conditions. With their defenses down, many of these patients can't yet count on what the rest of us can, that the new shots will protect them from the coronavirus. And this I hope to provide you with a little bit of comfort based upon information that we have, but know that we are still all learning together. I'm sure most of you saw these different editorials or articles in the Atlantic and the New York Times, which certainly elicited a lot of fear in our patient population. Here I wanted to show you what the true efficacy is of the COVID-19 vaccine based upon the clinical trials themselves. The vaccines that are currently available in the United States are these top two ones, the Moderna and Pfizer, as we know the J&J is currently on hold. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are both mRNA types of vaccines, which I'll go into a little bit more. They're both two-dose vaccines. Um, they both, uh, in the in the trials themselves, the trials did study the antibody response, which is the IgG response, also did study the T cell response in spe specifically in macaques. And both of these and, uh, vaccines did elicit very strong both antibody and T cell response. They were studied in thousands of different patients, again, not in those immunocompromised. And the protection due to, uh, from hospitalization was amazing um, for this new novel type of technology where patient 97% to 100% of patients were protected from severe infections due to COVID vaccine. That said, some people did still get uh, the COVID infection even after being double vaccinated, even in those who are immuno, uh, non -immun immuno who are immunocompetent. So how do the vaccines work? They all have something to do with this thing called the spike protein. The spike protein lives on the coronavirus on the surface itself. And what happens is that the vaccine, either with mRNA or a particle of adenovirus DNA, which with some of the other vaccines, then stick into this uh, the human cell, the receptor binding protein here in different ways. The body then codes for the spike protein and therefore learns how to um, recognize it should show up again. This is from an actual uh, COVID infection itself. This next picture shows you how the mRNA vaccine works, which is again, a novel technology. I just wanna pause and mention how incredible it is that within this pandemic, in the last year, our scientists have created a brand new type of vaccine using mRNA, and which has shown efficacy at the rates that I mentioned earlier. So this mRNA is in this lipid bilayer, which is injected in the vaccine. This is the actual part of what is in the vaccine itself. It gets introduced into the body and translates into a protein by the body. The body then amazingly produces these antibodies and a B cell and T cell response occurs and you create a robust immune response. Again, this encodes specifically for the spike protein. So all one can detect in the bloodstream will be a spike protein type of response. 
Our understanding of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 is incomplete, but rapidly advancing. And know that we are studying this and we want to get better answers for all of you. All of the vaccine studies measured the B and T cell response to the vaccine. B cell is known as the antibody response, which you hear often discussed in the media and able to be measured if requested at labs like LabCorp. And specifically, this is to the spike protein. Of note, the antibody response to a natural COVID uh, infection is to the nucleocapsid protein, So, um, but you may also show antibody response to the sp spike protein. But the, uh, the antibodies that can be tested at UCSF that we are able to get just ordering it um, after an infection is typically the nucleocapsid protein. The T cell response is able to be measured in a research setting. And for viral responses, we actually really want both the T cell response even more. This is actually the major immune defense against responses. And this gives us a robust viral response. You can see on the right, a projected response to the vaccine. In the blue, the B cell response, which is projected, and in the orange, T cell. Now, again, this is in an immunocompetent person. What really happens in an immunocompromised patient is still being studied. I wanted to make a, take a pause as well and mention that it is important to recognize that the vaccine response very often causes enlarged lymph nodes. I know this happened to me. This has happened to many of my patients and many of my colleagues. It's normal. So um, I'm sure Dr. Rugo and her colleagues have discussed with you as well, being wary of getting scans for about two to four weeks after getting a vaccine because lymph nodes can be enlarged and they can even light up on a PET, making it confusing to know what is this you know, a recurrence of cancer, which hopefully not, most likely it's more, uh, it's the immune response fighting off the COVID, uh, uh, responding to the vaccine itself. So a question, does the vaccine reduce asymptomatic transmission? As we know, a huge concern with the COVID-19 infection has been the rate of asymptomatic transmission. And so I really wanted to know the answer to this question, does the vaccine reduce this asymptomatic transmission? We have data to support that it does. We know that the viral load in the nasal mucosa is really the main driver of transmission of the COVID-19 virus, which is why masks are really effective. This paper out of Israel, where in Israel, they've really done an, an amazing job of vaccinating their entire population with the Pfizer vaccine. They observed that if one does get infected post-vaccine for reasons that may not be well understood, then the viral load in the nasal mucosa is significantly lower than it is compared to unvaccinated individuals. And this uh, means that, you know, even th so that means that the rate of transmission will be less. Since this time, there have been more than 12 publications supporting this. And on March 30th, Dr. Michelle Walensky of the CDC, uh, who's the director of the CDC, stated uh, that data suggested that vaccinated people do not carry the vaccine. I think this is helpful for immunocompromised patients being around other non-immunocompromised patients who are vaccinated and saying that it is extremely unlikely that they will be able to transmit the virus to you. The biggest question on my mind, though, is will the vaccine protect our immunocompromised patients? While it is known that the patients with cancer may be more vulnerable to COVID-19 viral infection, trying to disentangle the effects of cancer-directed therapies and the underlying malignancy on COVID-19 vaccine outcomes has been challenging. I want to point out that on the left side of the screen, you'll see a chart from the Infectious Disease Society of America, the IDSA, recommendations for vaccinations for patients with cancer. Now, you can see that they recommend many different types of vaccines, and this is, comes from, as I learned through the pandemic, limited data on the response of vaccinations in immunocompromised patients. But what you do find when you really delve into the details of the data is that there are small, unfortunately small, retrospective observational studies related to influenza vaccine, pneumococcal, hepatitis B, and Shingrix vaccinations. And they all do suggest that there is immune response in immunocompromised patients, both those kind of patients who have solid tumor malignancies and those who have hematologic malignancies. Um, with that in mind, though, I want to read a this, um, this next portion on the right side of the screen. Baking mentioned that this really has more to do with drugs related to patients who have hematologic malignancies. So it's unclear how many immunocompromised people don't respond to the coronavirus vaccine. The list though seems to include survivors of blood cancers, organ transplant recipients, and anyone who takes, who takes the widely used drug Ritzimab or cancer drugs such as Abruvica. 
which is a BTK inhibitor. I just want to point out that these are all the kinds of medications that are used in patients more with hematologic malignancies rather than solid organ malignancies. So we really worry more about the vaccine in, um, not being potentially not being as efficacious in patients with those types of malignancies. That said, unfortunately, I think all immunocompromised patients were, are still slightly at risk even after being vaccinated. Um, that's why it's important for all of us to get vaccinated to protect each other. So should I have the spike protein antibody checked? Big question comes up every day in my clinic and I'm sure in Dr. Rugel's clinic as well. My opinion is no, because I do think that our immune system is more complex, which I hope I helped to show you a little bit earlier where I showed that the T cell response is also just as important as the B cell response. And secondly, importantly, even if you get your antibody checked, should your behavior change because it is positive, it may make you feel better, but I don't think that behaviors should change yet. I don't think we know enough. I think we're still learning about how protective these vaccines will be. Um, it is possible though, to let, um, to let you know, to test for the COVID-19 spike antibody at lab course, should you want it. And many societies and UCSF are testing and studying the B and T cell response in immunocompromised patients to, um, specifically. Big question, can I travel after getting vaccinated? My opinion um, with the way the world is currently, with the way masking has worked, um, and with what we know about vaccinating immunocompetent patients is yes, I do think you can travel. I think you can travel domestically. I think you must be cautious when you travel. I recommend traveling if you are going to with vaccinated friends, friends and family, so making sure your pod are all vaccinated. Um, and then when you do go anywhere, you go to a small group of vaccinated friends and family. But I want us to be back to, you know, cautiously going back to slightly normal life, seeing our friends, family, loved ones who live around the country. I do suggest, and this was recommended by the uh, CDC and by Monica Gandhi, who is an infectious disease, um, sort of the lead of infectious disease at UCSF, and she has many publications out, that while traveling, consider using a double mask. Uh, or a mask with a filter, and of course, still maintaining your distance as much as possible. I still do really love those, um, those flights that allow the middle seat to remain empty. And my last slide is, and this is by Monica Gandhi itself, but one of her, one of her talks is, um, you know, important that we want to motivate, um, we want to message optimism, not doom. And this is based on the CDC guidelines that if vaccinated and vaccinated people, the CDC recommends that you can mingle together without masks and distancing. I think it's okay even for immunocompromised patients to, who are vaccinated hanging out with their immunocompetent friends who have been vaccinated as well. But vaccinated around unvaccinated, I think in your home, it's probably okay. But outside of your home, probably you should be, remain with the same precautions that you currently have with COVID. And then of course, unvaccinated with unvaccinated, keep all usual uh, restrictions. So in summary, I say, do not hesitate, do get vaccinated. Um, do vaccinate your family and your pod. I think this will help with everyone feeling more protected. The best vaccine is one offered to you today. Antibody response um, can be measured. The B cell response to the spike protein can be measured at lab core, but currently the T, T cell mediated response is on, is a, can be only measured under research studies. It's not available um, just at, at any lab at this time. For now though, act as though you're not vaccinated, meaning wear your mask. Most gatherings should be outdoors. Should You can have small indoor gatherings with vaccinated individuals, probably okay. And know that we're researching the effects of the vaccine so that we can provide you the most detailed information. So stay tuned for updates. And I hope that we will, we will get more updates and learn more as in the coming months as more and more of our world is vaccinated and as these studies are ongoing. This is a great resource for, uh, for patients um, under this website, the COVID-19 and Cancer Consortium, and has all of these different guidelines available for you. Um, great place to check out just to read about things if you have questions. And uh, I thank you for your time. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Shagan. And I think that um, it's, uh, I think it would, uh, it's kind of nice to keep the picture up there, but you know, it's all this oh, sorry. trying to understand it, but it's okay. The, uh, I think that um, there are a lot of questions that uh, came up to us even before uh, we started. So just to start with a few are, um, 
uh, the idea, I think, you know, you talked about some of the hematologic issues that, you know, hematologic treatments that might impact your ability to make an effective immune response. And I think one of the important things you said is we don't actually really even know how to measure an effective immune response, which is important. So the question is that if you're living with metastatic breast cancer, does having metastatic disease in and of itself make a difference? One of the questions that came up was, some of the drugs cause low neutrophils. Does that mean that if your neutrophils are low periodically, is that mean that your immune system is not good and you're more likely to not make an immune response? Yeah, great question. And I can understand why, you know, it would, why that question comes up. And I would think about it as well, but I, the neutrophils are a different type of cell than the T cells are. Um, I, I don't think that being neutropenic affects your response to the vaccination itself. That said, of course, you're still at risk for other types of infections when you're neutropenic. So similar precautions should be in place. The first part of the question, though, regarding the treatments or, or having metastatic breast cancer itself, um, most of this, most of the limited information that we have, I'm just, of course, prefacing it with the word limited because it is currently limited. We will know more with time, but suggest that solid organ malignancies are have a different immune response and slightly better immune response than does somebody who has a bone marrow or blood related cancer. So I think that the uh, solid organ malignancy world, so patients who have metastatic breast cancer should have some type of response, even if we cannot measure it, and so should have some level of protection. I say this all though, and also um, back it up with, you still need to be careful and we still need to follow precautions and hanging out in big crowds is not recommended. The other part of that's important to mention is what type of therapy you might be on because people who are on say immunotherapy probably have a less immune response to somebody who is say on endocrine therapy alone or even chemotherapy, they pro their body probably will still be able to mount a decent immune response. I wish we could measure this for everyone and get solid answers so that everyone could feel comfortable. Um, we're not there yet, but I do think, I hope we'll get there with time. And I think that the more and more population that's vaccinated will be protective for everyone involved. Yeah, we've seen interestingly, I mean, these are different vaccines than we've seen before, but we've seen immune responses in patients who've had all sorts of reasons for being immunocompromised uh, before. Uh, and so, and we know that vaccines can help patients who are immunocompromised, even people who have common variable immunodeficiency can mount a small immune uh, response. So that's helpful. I think one of the questions was whether there are cutoffs for neutrophils and lymphocytes and how you really define immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. And I think that you commented on that well. I think most of the treatments that we give our breast cancer patients, including chemotherapy, are not probably fitting into that category. You know, checkpoint inhibitors would be the main question. And um, since we have yet, to, knock on wood, seen a patient with a checkpoint inhibitor with COVID who has breast cancer, UCSF, I think uh, we just have no idea. It does suggest that it's not a scourge, you know, although we've been incredibly fortunate in Northern California with lower infection rates and mortality. But, um, the other thing that's really come up a lot is that, you know, some people get a really um, robust response to the second vaccine. And we have, mm -hmm. you know, anecdotal feeling that it's worse with Moderna than with Pfizer, uh, but uh, which I think a lot of people do. But does that correlate? Do we have any idea about the degree of immunity? Um, and is there, uh, somebody asked if it has to do with lymph nodes removed and it doesn't, but um, that, that's a question. Like if you had a bad reaction, are you someone, if you got COVID, you would have gotten sicker? because you react more, or does it just yeah. mean you're having more of a robust immune response? Yeah, great question. And uh, I, I don't think we know the answer, but I got to say that when you have a good response to the vac, when you have when you get sick due to the vaccine, you do feel like, all right, thank you to those spike <laughs> proteins. I think you exist in my blood now. Yeah. But I don't think we, I don't think we, it doesn't correlate, you know, it directly that we have data on to, to know. Yeah, that would be a really right. interesting thing, though, right, to, to actually ask to get this observational information from patients. And while we're studying perhaps their spike protein and T cell response, maybe having that be one of the questions we ask them as well. Yeah, there's so much variable reaction, and we've also seen so much variable intensity of infection. So maybe there, you know, if we were 
you can't go and look at that, but it's possible that whatever makes you get a more robust response would have made you get a worse inspection, who knows, because you would have been able to mount more of this, you know, sort of bad immune response to the wrong part of the virus, who knows. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, you know, we talked about some of the treatments. I don't think we know that getting radiation also changes your immune response, right? Um, no, I don't, I do not think so. I do not think yeah. so. And then uh, if you, um, let's see, uh, one of the questions, uh, how to how to kids factor into your recommendation for travel planning who have not been vaccinated? Okay, so I think what this means is that if you, um, if there are kids that have not been vaccinated where you're traveling to, you know, you're visiting family, what do you do about that? That's really tough. That I think that's challenging. Um, you know, I, I am of the mind that we have to get back to living a little bit. And so there may be a small risk of being around other children, but that's where the community of vaccinating vaccinated people come into play. So if the kids are around adults who are all vaccinated and the chances of a child getting an asymptomatic COVID infection is lower. And the second part is that I do think that even if the immune response in the immunocompromised patient is not robust, there is probably some immune response. And so if one were to contract a COVID vaccine, uh, infection, I'm hoping that the, the intensity of the reaction will be less, but um, that, that's a hard question. And um, I think that takes some thinking and probably talking through with, the, with your doctor and weighing risks and benefits. And again, comes into you know, keeping things small. Right. Um, and uh, if you have, um, I think it's a, this ongoing question in our chat is, uh, our Q&A is, if you had a bad reaction and you never had COVID, does it seem like you mounted an immune response? Um, and if you're, you know, the, nobody's correlated the reaction after dose one or two with how well you're protected, right? Um, well, there, the risk. Actually, they have assessed antibody response in immunocompetent patients after one dose versus second doses. And yeah. I believe that after first dose, it was around 60%. And after second doses, it was upwards of the 92% or so based upon the antibody response. But that doesn't, the rates of infection, though, were even better than that. You know, the rates of infection, the rates of protection were upwards of 98 to 100%. Um, but the question, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question though? I'm I think sorry, it's like I, if the reaction you have after dose one or two has anything to do with how robust your immune system is. And then if you had a bad reaction to the vaccine, does it, is it likely you mounted an immune response? Yeah, um, I, I don't think we have that correlative data. Yeah, I don't think we know any of that really. And then um, one question is, uh, is UCSF enrolling patients, people with cancer who have received a COVID vaccine in a study or registry to assess efficacy in this population, something that we're very interested in doing and have been talking a lot about in the solid exactly. side. I think you are doing that in hemolignancies and we're trying to organize to do that in solid tumors also. Exactly, exactly. We are undergoing IRB approval right now for the hemolignancies world. And I know that hope, uh, you know, Dr. Rugo and I think Dr. Sinar have been working on putting some uh, a protocol together for the solid organ world as well. The last question is, what do you think, um, what should somebody do if they have, I think there's two parts to this. Um, if they have gotten vaccinated and then get COVID, what does that mean uh, to them? And is there any take home message? I suppose you really then have immunity, but um, are, is there any way to know? Yeah, um, so I think that that's a really interesting population of patients and I wish we could get their B cell and T cell responses pre and post these things. Unfortunately, it always happens retrospectively. Um, I think that you could check the nucleocapsid type antibody response after an actual, you know, a, a natural COVID infection and assess it. But recognizing that even in the immunocompetent patients, uh, COVID uh, infection did occur even after those patients were vaccinated. So there is, a, there are patients who do get um, infected even after they're vaccinated. People who are not immunocompromised 
do get infected even after a vaccination. My hope is that if one does get infected, that the intensity of the infection will be much reduced because of perhaps the, the they, they were vaccinated before. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the general take from everybody nationally is that if you had the vaccine and you get COVID, your, re, your illness is less, although we still would treat with antibodies if somebody has symptomatic COVID, which we did recently in somebody who had previous vaccination, but wasn't getting treatment that affected the immune response. So and I think the last two uh, questions really are, um, if you get an antibody test against the spike protein and you haven't mounted an antibody response, you can't get revaccinated right now, right? So you should treat yourself as being sort of maybe only a little protected. That's exactly right. And that's why I, you know, when I put up my slide about whether or not you should test your antibodies, my opinion is no, because I don't think that we should change behaviors yet for those immunocompetent nor immunocompromised. Um, I, I, and I think that, um, I don't think that, you know, even if it was positive, I still think you should be, you should try to protect yourself from COVID uh, infection. And if it's negative, of course, you should protect yourself from a COVID infection. That and then knows. comes into play that, I'm sorry, the T cell response as well, which is, is not measured by the antibody. All right. So we're really, even if you get these tests, they're just not really measuring your immunity well. And um, I, I think uh, when they start giving J and J again, um, would you get it? Oh, good question. Good question. Luckily, I've already been vaccinated with by the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I think that I, I think I would. I think that it's. Uh, I would. I'd be worried, but I think I would get it. Yeah. I. Uh, what does the rest of the panel think about that? Yeah. Yeah. What does everybody think? Uh, Natalie. I, I would get it. Because I mean, the incidence is still very low. If you think about all the people who got the vaccine and then the pulmonary embolus and or the, the clotting problem and the consumptive problem from the vaccine, it's actually still a really small amount of people. Totally. Yeah, I was so interested that the numbers were lower than when you were pregnant, having the same kind of clots. That's, that's, that seems to be something we do quite willingly. But. That's a very good point, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then the incidence was lower. Um, so, um, and let's see, there are some other questions here about variants. I think that we're, we believe that, you know, we're going to need boosters and they're not ready yet. Um, I think you know, we're for some of the variants. Actually, Monica, Monica Gandhi just came out saying that she doesn't think we're going to need a booster from the, with the, with the variants. She thinks that the current vaccines are going to be protective over variants, but we'll see how things go. And of course, we'll keep ourselves, ourselves and our patients updated. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And um, I, I think you brought up one good, uh, really good point, uh, Dr. Rugo, regarding the antibody treatment that I didn't mention in my presentation as, at all. But I want to make the point that all of our patients who are immunocompromised or have just a diagnosis of a malignancy, even if you're on maintenance treatment or, um, or, or what have you, are eligible for monoclonal antibody treatments. So I want you to be, you know, Make sure you tell your doctors at UCSF if you do contract COVID-19 in any time at all, and especially if you're having symptoms, we'd love to get you the monoclonal antibody treatment. Yeah, I think that, and that is actually really easy to organize. Um, and uh, people have a variety of other questions, which I think we need to move on and talk about some of our other our topics. This is obviously really big on everybody's minds, but like if you got the vaccine while you had COVID, but were asymptomatic and didn't know you had COVID, does it matter? <laughs> I don't think it does matter actually, but. No. Um, and um, then I, I think people are still quite concerned about what immunocompromised means. Um, and also if your recommendation about being feeling okay about the J&J &J vaccine would change if you were hypercoagulable. Oh. Yeah, you know, actually tomorrow we're having a Grand Rounds, uh, Medicine Grand Rounds, where Dr. Andy Levitt, who is the head of our non malignant hematology program and sort of the master of thromboses, um, mm -hmm. will be talking specifically about the risk. Um, but I think that's a really excellent question. I probably wouldn't. I'd probably take that, the J&J &J off the table if I, you know, if I had a hypercoagulable disorder. I'm presuming though, if you were hypercoagulable, you're also anticoagulated too. So that may mitigate the risk of the vaccine. That's what but I would you, think, yeah. Yeah, but if 
if you had a choice, then perhaps um, you could think about a different type. Oh, so I'm going to leave you to answer a couple of questions that are still in our uh, Q&A, um, if you don't Great. want to terribly. Thank you very, very much for participating. And uh, we'll move you. on, and we're going to actually talk about immunotherapy a little bit. Um, now, uh, Laura Hubbard will talk some about immunotherapy and also CDK46 inhibitors. And stay with us. We have a lot of exciting areas to talk about. Laura's going to talk about this area. Now we're going to hear some about surgery. And Natalie Marshall is a great, a big interest in exercise and is working in this area. Is going to talk about some about the data we have on lifestyle factors, but also a really cool study called Baby Tam for prevention of breast cancer. Laura, you're on. You're on mute. Perfect. Let me unmute myself. Perfect. Um, great. Um, so my name is Dr. Laura Hopper. I'm one of the fellows that works with Dr. Rugo. So thank you so much, Dr. Rugo, for inviting me today. Um, and I'm going to pick up um, on some more immunology discussion, which is really great. Um, but this time talking about um, immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and in the context of, um, in this case, um, talking about the Keynote 355 trial. Um, but I first wanted to just give you guys a little bit of an overview of how does immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors work. So I made a little graphic and bear with me um, for my uh, amateur um, effort here. But um, so how immunotherapy works. So dendritic cells are a type of cells that prime the T cells and T cells are a, a really important um, type of cell that basically will then go into your bloodstream and find your cancer cells and fight the cancer cells and then help destroy cancer cells. So T cells are really important um, in everybody's body for like finding cells that become malignant cells and ideally destroying them before they turn into active malignancy. And then once you have cancer, they are what kind of keeps the malignancy suppressed and help fight the cancer. So they're really important. And so the problem is T cells can sometimes also recognize normal tissue. So they can recognize you know, cells in your gut or other cells. So rather than having T cells activated all the time with the, I've indicated with the green bars, you also need to be able to turn off the T cells. So you don't have, you know, autoimmune conditions. That, that's what can happen if T cells, you know, start fighting yourself is that you get autoimmune conditions. So you have to really be able to turn off the T cells too. So you have these signals that both turn on and turn off the T cells in fighting um, tissue. So the problem is, is that tumor cells can basically learn to use these off signals to also turn off the T cells. So they're pretty smart and they'll say, I can also turn off the T cell myself by expressing these receptors. And then what would have you know, resolved in tumor cell death, now you're no longer killing the tumor. And so what really we wanna do is to turn off those off signals. So it's like a double negative is how can we block those abilities for the tumor cell to turn off the T cell and thus allow the T cell to resume fighting the tumor. And so that's kind of the principle of checkpoint inhibitors is it's creating this double negative where we're turning off that off signal. Um, and I combined it here just to show you the, the names of them, which many of you will recognize. Um, so there's PD-1 is one of the off signals that's on the T cell and that's nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Um, Keytruda and um, Optivo. Um, there's PDL1 inhibitors, which is another um, one of the off signals on the tumor side. And those are the drugs atezolizumab, which is often used in breast cancer, avelolibab, durvalumab as well. And we also have CTLA4 inhibitors. Um, so I think it's just helpful to understand how immunotherapy works. It's, it's that double negative, turning off the off signal and thus allowing the T cell to effectively fight the tumor. Um, so that's kind of the principle of checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so in breast cancer um, to date, we've done a lot of our study of um, checkpoint inhibitors in triple negative um, breast cancer. Um, and so um, this study, the Keynote 355 study, um, was present, an update was presented at San Antonio. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about this trial. Um, so this trial is um, combining, so it's taking patients who have a metastatic or inoperable triple negative breast cancer um, and randomizing them to receive chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab, which is one of those um, checkpoint inhibitors, or chemotherapy and placebo. So basically it's asking, does the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy help improve outcomes for these patients? Um, and stratified patients two to one to, to get the pembro. Um, and so some results from this trial were presented at San Antonio, um, which were pretty exciting. Um, and here the the teal color is the combination of the chemotherapy and the pembro. 
and the dark red is the chemotherapy alone. Um, and basically what this graph is showing is that the combination adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy um, improved progression-free survival for these patients um, to 9.7 months versus only 5.6 months without the um, checkpoint inhibitor in patients who have um, PDL1 high disease, which we won't get into the specifics, but basically we can test the tumor and see, is it more um, immunogenically active or not? Like, is it more likely to express the PDL1, which indicates it may be more likely to respond to these checkpoint inhibitors? Um, so Laura, this, do you want to just briefly define progression-free survival? Oh, definitely. Um, so progression-free survival um, is one of, so whenever we do trials, we look at, you know, various out, um, kind of clinical outcomes and progression-free survival is one we often look at. Um, and it's the time from when we start you on that therapy, um, how long can we, how long is it until you progress? And um, so with the, with the addition of Pembro, these patients could be on the treatment for almost 10 months before they had progression at another site versus without the um, chemo, without the Keytruda or without the pembrolizumab, they progressed faster. So they progressed in five and a half months. Um, so and really the cancer, I, just to clarify, it means that the cancer grew. Yeah. So for example, if you had some tumors and they shrunk down, when they started to grow again is how we evaluate progression-free survival. Yep. So um, I think this was really exciting. Um, and um, in addition to looking at the progression-free survival, which is, you know, when it starts growing again, so that time extended, um, there was also data to show that the response rate and the duration of response was longer, um, that people, when they, when they did respond, the, this response lasted longer. Um, what we ultimately look for in clinical trials is the overall survival. So, you know, does this actually help patients survive longer? Um, and that data is still forthcoming. We don't have the results. It takes a little bit longer to get that data from any trial because we have to, to wait longer and see how patients do. Um, but I think this was really encouraging. Um, and based on this trial, um, the combination of pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy um, was FDA approved in November. Um, and so um, I think this is an exciting area. The addition of immunotherapy um, to chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer um, is really exciting. Um, and we're still, you know, trying to now understand this was in the metastatic setting. Is there, are there patients where we could use immunotherapy in an earlier stage setting? Can immunotherapy be used for, you know, ER positive disease? There's many other questions in the breast cancer world about how we can use, use immunotherapy and choosing which patients we think are most likely going to benefit from immunotherapy. Um, so I think there are still a lot of unanswered questions in the breast cancer world, but I think this was just um, an interesting um, study to share with you all to show you uh, and to talk a little bit more about why and how we care about immunotherapy. Well, I'm so good. I'm just gonna make a couple of comments here. There was prior to this study, another trial that looked at another checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab is also known as Keytruda. Um, and uh, the other uh, drug, atezolizumab um, as uh, Tecentric is a drug which also was combined with chemotherapy and interestingly, he showed uh, a much a smaller actually improvement in the time until the disease progresses called progression-free survival, but it showed a survival benefit. So a median, this is not everybody, it's like you know, the middle of the range, uh, overall survival benefit of seven and a half months in people whose cancers also were PDL1 positive who got a tezolizumab or tecentric along with a taxane drug called a braxane. Another trial was done which showed that if you combined the same drug, atezolizumab with Taxol, it didn't benefit anything. It was absolutely as if you didn't give it at all, except for you get the side effects, the immune side effects. We don't really understand why those differences exist. And the FDA actually has called a meeting to try and look at these in more detail, these questions, and try and understand how to really um, focus on who benefits from adding immunotherapy, which has known toxicity. And uh, that, those meetings will occur next week. Uh, I don't know that they're going to come to any greater conclusions because they don't have any more data than what I just told you. Uh, but uh, they are hoping to get more information that will give us an answer to this. And of course, there are studies going on um, with some positive results already looking at these drugs in early stage triple negative breast cancer. Um, the, some questions that else that came up were, the status of immunotherapy and hormone receptor positive breast cancer, it's being, available, it's being evaluated 
Um, it seems as though you need to focus on the metastatic breast cancer that's more aggressive and less hormone responsive in order to see benefits. We actually published one of the only data sets available in hormone receptor positive disease and saw some responses, but just it was a small number. Um, but we will be opening a trial in the next couple of months, I think, two, two months or so, where we'll be looking at this in patients with metastatic hormone receptor prior chemotherapy, where patients will receive the chemotherapy with either the checkpoint inhibitor or not. And then these uh, studies all look at locally recurrent um, or uh, metastatic disease. And locally recurrent means if you have a lot of cancer on your chest wall or and then lymph nodes and your neck, et cetera, that is um, maybe not completely metastatic, but it's not able to be removed by surgery. So that's what local means. And then uh, somebody asked you, Laura, do these studies report on quality of life? Is um, progression-free survival have any proxy about quality of life? Um, that's a great I, question. I know so I don't want to stick you with that. But. Oh, no, go for it. Um, I, it wasn't present. I don't know that quality of life was presented yet for this study. Um, uh, most of these studies do collect quality of life data um, and will present it at some point. I don't know if you know the status of it for this trial, Dr. Rigo. Yeah, there, there has been uh, patient reported outcome data that, um, whoops, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the computer is being very sad here. Uh, but uh, the um, uh, in this um, quality of life data where the patient reported outcomes are reported, um, we in for atezolizumab, we saw very good results. And I think it really balances the question of trying to understand the risk versus benefit, which is what the question is really getting towards. And so far, it's generally been directed towards benefit rather than risk, because although we know risk, uh, the drugs themselves are tolerated very well. And where the issue comes up with quality of life, it's all with uh, immune type toxicities, not due to the checkpoint inhibitor infusions themselves. For example, they don't cause nausea or hair loss or those kinds of things that chemo does. So you don't see differences. But I will uh, let you go on now with your next topic. Sure. Um, so the other um, abstract from San Antonio that I wanted to share, which is really an important one, is Monarch E, um, which is the combination of abemocyclib with adjuvant endocrine therapy for high-risk early um, breast cancer, which we'll get into what that means in a second. Um, so CDK4-6 inhibitors, um, there's three of them. Um, so many of you might either be on these drugs or have heard of these drugs. They're also um, on the news these days, Chair, you'll see ads for them on TV. Um, but abemocyclib is one that's also called Verzenio. Um, palbocyclib is ibrance and ribocyclib is cascali. Um, and what these drugs do is they target the cell cycle machinery and interrupt intracellular and mitogenic hormone signals that stimulate the proliferation of malignant cells. Um, and we give these drugs in combination with endocrine therapy um, to see if that will help improve um, outcomes. And so Monarch E um, is a study um, that took patients, like I said, with hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative early stage breast cancer. Um, so after they had gotten surgery and radiation, if they needed it, and they were going to um, get endocrine therapy, um, they were randomized to either get standard of care endocrine therapy, so just endocrine therapy alone um, for five to 10 years, or standard of care endocrine therapy plus abemocyclib, which is one of the Verzenio, one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, and importantly, these were um, patients with higher risk early stage breast cancer. Um, so as you can see here, they either had greater than or equal to four positive lymph nodes um, and or they could have had one to three positive lymph nodes and grade three cancer or a tumor size that was greater than five centimeters. So they specifically in this trial um, study patients with higher risk early stage breast cancer. Um, and so the results from this study were also presented at San Antonio, um, which was really um, exciting um, because it showed that um, there was a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in invasive disease-free survival, which I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but at two years, 
92.3% of patients who had the, were in the abemaciclib arm and um, compared to 89.3% in the endocrine therapy arm um, had uh, invasive disease-free survival. So there was a 3% improvement. And what that basically means, invasive disease-free survival is, is the cancer coming back um, either locally or distantly? So is, is the cancer coming back? And so as you can see, most of these patients, the cancer did not come back almost 90%, even without the abema, but there was 3% more people did not have the cancer come back with the addition of abemacyclib, um, which seems like small, but that's three in a hundred people that didn't have a recurrence that could have had a recurrence. Um, so that was statistically significant, I think important to, to see. Um, and then what we also really worry about is in addition to the cancer coming back locally, that what we really worry about is that it you know, can, coming back at a metastatic site, going to the liver or the brain or the lung. Um, and importantly here, there was also a 3% improvement with the addition of abemacyclib. Um, so it also improved the, you know, risk The adding abemacyclib reduced the risk of having a metastatic recurrence um, in that time period. Um, so side effects getting back, we, um, sorry, I didn't get into the immune related side effects, but met, wanted to mention that here. So abemacyclib frequently causes um, diarrhea and causes some fatigue and neutropenia. So it's not without some side effects, but we can actually manage these side effects quite well. Um, we have patients um, that are on the, you know, if they, if they do develop the diarrhea, we can, um, they can take a modium and we can work with them to try to manage that side effect. Um, we'll check blood counts. Um, and so it's, it's definitely not without side effects, um, but um, we are able to work with our patients to help manage these in most cases. Um, so in conclusion, the, this study showed that the addition of abemacyclib to endocrine therapy improved both the local risk of disease recurrence and the risk of distant disease. Um, and, and here we're also awaiting the overall survival data. So does this actually improve um, survival for patients? Um, but I thought this was an important study to share with you all because uh, it's a, definitely a notable treatment advance, particularly for patients with high risk node positive breast cancer. Um, but I did want to make the caveat that um, at the same time that this trial was going on with abemacyclib, um, there, there have been studies going on with the two other CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, so the Penelope B trial studied palbocyclib, and interestingly, that trial um, found no benefit. Um, and there's a trial called the Natalie trial, which we are participating in here at UCSF, which hasn't been released yet. Um, so there's been a lot of debate of why was you know, the palbo trial negative and this trial positive. Um, in the metastatic setting, the um, efficacy of these drugs um, is all very similar. So we suspect that it's not that you know, one drug is better than the other, and, and rather it might have been um, related to the types of patients that were enrolled in the specifics of study design. Um, and I'll let Dr. Rugo um, say this even more eloquently than me, um, but I think we're eager to see the results of the Natalie as well. Um, but I think this is an important study for patients with high risk early stage breast cancer to consider whether CDK4-6 inhibitors should be added to their endocrine therapy. Yeah, that was great. Um, I think that, uh, you know, that this is really interesting. Only 25% of people, about a quarter, had finished two years of abemaciclib at this last presentation. So it's still quite early. Um, and in a very, in a much smaller trial, Penelope B only was a uh, thousand plus, whereas these trials were over 5,000. Um, that where patients had residual cancer after they got neoadjuvant chemotherapy, chemotherapy before surgery, um, though that showed some, it looked like there was going to be a benefit. And then the farther out uh, they went, the benefit seemed to narrow. So maybe it has to do with the fact that they only gave a year of the palbociclib. And the PALAS trial where patients got two years, almost 50% of people stopped the drug due to protocol mandates, for example, low blood counts. Whereas in this trial, only a little under 18% stopped the drug due to the diarrhea symptoms. So, you know, the also the Monarch E population had a higher risk cancer. So I think we need longer follow-up. There's no indication yet to give CDK4-6 inhibitors for early stage disease, uh, but we're hopeful that early next year, we'll see more mature data from Monarch E that can be considered by the FDA potentially for our patients who have higher risk hormone receptor positive cancer. The Natalie trial is looking at three years. All the other, these other big ones were two years and Penelope one year. And the Natalie trial has just completed enrolling patients. Uh, so we're hoping to see data um, in the next uh, couple of years 
uh, that will help us understand uh, whether they actually added a whole bunch of patients who had very uh, high risk early stage breast cancer, maybe that will help us. So. Oh, Hope, I wanted to bring one thing up about yeah. the monarchy about, there was a, a specific subgroup of patients that had the PI 67 of 20% um, or greater, who actually had a 4.5% decreased risk of invasive disease free survival. So there is a group that actually even had more than that 3% benefit. Actually, the part of that uh, investigation, you could get on the trial in a separate category if you had a high KI67, which measures cell turnover, or how rapid the cancer is growing. Um, and it was centrally confirmed because this is a test which is notoriously difficult to interpret and often pathologists disagree even with themselves. So the KI67 actually turned out to be, and this was a separate presentation, um, actually was a, a marker of the aggressiveness of your cancer. So it had some, what we call prognostic impact, but also it seemed to predict even more benefit as Natalie mentioned from the addition of abemaciclib. And obviously we need to follow it longer, but to me, this is very, very intriguing. And I think, you know, we're gonna need to have some way of standardizing the test so that we can believe it. Um, and know when, when we should test it um, and all of that as we move forward. But uh, I think the next year we'll learn a lot more about this really important marker that you brought up. So um, I think that we should go on now, uh, potentially, unless there's any other comments from the uh, panel at all, or we, just to mention, we have an endocrine neoadjuvant, endocrine therapy before surgery, protocol that our colleague Joe Chen has organized, um, kind of like our iSpy program, and it's multi-center um, around the United States. That should be opening in May, and it will look at endocrine therapy, different novel hormone therapies, and some different targeted agents before surgery to see if we can shrink the cancers that don't respond to chemotherapy, but are hormone receptor positive, so I think really important. So I think we'll now move on to our surgeons. Michael and Teresa. Sounds great. Everyone, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so today, Dr. Alvarado and I thought we'd talk about what happens after you have a lumpectomy, particularly in terms of surveillance or watching for new cancers. So after surgery, patients do need imaging to watch for cancers coming back, what we would call a local recurrence, but also to make sure in the breast that had cancer and the other breast that there isn't a new cancer developing. And the most common ways to look um, to image patients to do that surveillance is mammogram. People sometimes also use MRI and also um, ultrasound. So after, lumpect after lumpectomy, the good news is that the majority of patients don't have the cancer come back. Um, but we still do need to keep an eye out to make sure we catch anything new that does develop. And again, this risk is very, very low of that second cancer. The most common follow-up imaging that people get is a mammogram. And it's really perfect for more than 70% of all breast cancer survivors. Many, many medical studies have shown that mammogram actually works very, very well. So if a mammogram is recommended, how often should you be getting that mammogram? Well, most patients will be told that six months after surgery, that's when you wanna get that first mammogram in that breast that had breast cancer. And that gives us a new baseline, something to follow. And then six months after that, we can usually resume then annual mammograms for both breasts. There are some situations though, where patients for the side that had cancer had that surgery will need a mammogram more often. Um, and this is really a case-by-case -case basis. So if that surgery site, what's happening is that scar tissue continues to change or remodel, it can start to look differently on that mammogram. And so we want to follow you every six months on that side for at least the first few years until that scar tissue stabilizes. And so some patients may be told that for the cancer, the breast that had cancer in it where you had surgery, um, you might need a mammogram every six months and then annually for, for both breasts, just for that screening of the other breast. Um, so what about MRI for screening for surveillance following up after surgery? Well, it can be very beneficial. Um, MRI though is also very sensitive and sometimes it picks things up uh, that you can't see on a mammogram. And so it's picking up things that aren't always cancer. Um, so sometimes can cause a bit more alarm than is needed. And these things aren't always worrisome. 
And so it's important to pick MRI, um, using MRI for the right patients. So why not use MRI for everyone? Well, firstly, it's likely unlikely to benefit everyone. Sometimes it can cause more harm than good. It is more costly, and it will require you to have to have an IV put in the day you're having that imaging done. And that's because we need to put contrast into your veins to make sure we can see the breast tissue clearly. And when we see abnormalities on that mammogram that we don't see on, um, sorry, when we see abnormalities on that MRI that we don't see on mammogram, it may lead to unnecessary biopsies. So biopsies are sampling of tissue that otherwise um, doesn't have cancer in it. So we do need to choose wisely. So who are the people to benefit from using MRI to uh, look for new cancers or recurrent cancers? Well, usually this will be patients who are under the age of 40, so very young patients, and that's because they often have extremely dense breast tissue. And this is something that you might have seen uh, written on an, a mammogram report, the grading of your breast density. And it's important to distinguish dense tissue from what's written then on that report as extremely dense. Um, patients who might have had a higher risk of that cancer coming back, so if that first cancer you had was a larger tumor, if you had positive lymph nodes or cancer found in those lymph nodes under the, under the um, arm area there. And if the patient had received chemotherapy before surgery, but didn't have a good response, so the cancer didn't completely go away, you might be a good candidate for an MRI for surveillance. Um, it also depends on the future risk of having another brand new cancer. So not just that same cancer coming back, but a new occurrence. And this is where we would look to your family history, genetic test results, if you had genetic testing done, things like BRCA1 and 2, um, your age, and also the type of breast cancer you had initially. So was it estrogen receptor positive or hormone positive or not? And really, this all becomes an important discussion for you to have with your surgeon, for you to have with your medical oncologist. Um, and just to look at some recent information that's been published, um, general recommendations and what different associations have shown. So in a study, authors looked at 21 different guidelines. Um, there were about 18 different groups that were polled, medical societies, government institutions, mixed collaborations, um, physicians from radiology groups and oncology groups. And what they thought was that really the majority of people would recommend bilateral mammograms for surveillance every year. So about 94% of those surveyed. Every year, um, 3D mammograms, you know, that was much less popular. Only about 6% of people would have recommended that. In terms of routine use of ultrasound, only about 11% would have recommended that. The routine use of MRI for everyone was only recommended by about 12% of people. Um, but in contrast, for special groups, groups where patients who had a higher risk, like we talked about with genetic test results that might tell us you're at a higher risk of getting a new cancer or a re recurrent cancer, um, MRI was recommended by about 33% of, of people. So again, it should be a discussion with your oncology team. And most women really do excellently with only annual mammograms for surveillance. Um, so in some women, the cancer may come back. We call that a recurrence. Um, but this is happening much and much less frequently, which is a good thing. So most, and some women will also have a brand new cancer in the same breast or in the opposite breast. So what are options if that cancer does come back? Well, for a long time, there was really only one option, and that was that you had to have a mastectomy, so removing all of the breast tissue from that breast. And this was especially true in patients who had previously had a lumpectomy and radiation um, in that first breast uh, cancer occurrence. But really, things are changing now, and we have a couple new techniques we can use. So one option now would be a mastectomy, again, removing all that breast tissue, and you may consider reconstruction or without reconstruction. Another option, um, again, is doing a second lumpectomy, and you may or may not add radiation to that after that surgery. So who might be a good candidate for a second lumpectomy? For women who do want to keep their breast tissue, um, when is this a more possible option? So if the recurrence happens later, um, maybe five years or seven years after that first time you had a breast cancer, um, when the cancer comes back, if it's a small tumor, that's more favorable to having a lumpectomy. Um, if the recurrence is DCIS, also known as a precancer or ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, and also if it's a new cancer away from the first one, so in a separate part of the breast, and it has favorable or good characteristics. So looking at that cancer, that tumor biology. 
So really it's a case by case decision and discussion with your surgeon and oncology team. Um, there are new techniques for doing radiation a second time in the past. Um, it wouldn't have even been considered, but now we do have other options. So we do want to, you to weigh the risks and benefits of each of the interventions that are offered. So here's an example of a patient we've been following. Um, her history is that she's a 62 year old woman. She had an estrogen sensitive breast cancer. So ER positive also called 11 years ago. And with that first cancer, she had a lumpectomy also known as a partial mastectomy and radiation then to the whole breast. Um, she did chemotherapy and also endocrine therapy. So that hormone therapy for five years, medications you might've heard of like aromatase inhibitors. And then on one of her surveillance mammograms, she has calcification. So new calcium deposits were found on that image um, in that breast, far away from that first cancer. When we did a biopsy of that area, it was found to be DCIS, again, that in situ or precancerous lesion. And it was graded by the pathology team as grade one, so low grade, low risk. Well, she decided then um, she was a good candidate for a lumpectomy and she opted to not have any more radiation. Um, it was about two centimeters of ductal carcinoma in situ, that pre-malignant lesion. And the thought was that since this was a brand new lesion or thing, pre-cancer, her risk of it coming back again is likely only to be about 15% over the next 10 years of her life. Um, so she was very happy not to have a mastectomy. And so far she's been cancer-free for about six years now. So we wanna just open up to the floor for questions if you've had anything. Great. That was great. Uh, that was great. Thanks a lot. Very, very good. Um, I think that you know there may be a fair number of questions that people definitely uh, feel free to put any questions into the um, Q&A box. Um, one question that came up was, at what age can you stop having mammograms? A uh, uh, patient is 74, had a lumpectomy in 51. Um, and has metastatic breast cancer is being treated with Zolota. So why, why is she still getting mammograms? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a great question. And I think that those are the kind of discussions that are really important um, that you kind of have with the oncologist, your oncologist, and also your breast surgeon. Um, it may be that, for example, uh, in that case, you might even consider doing a mammogram every two years, um, depending on your breast density and kind of what it looks like and how your, your metastatic breast cancer is being controlled. I think if, if you're doing wonderfully with your, your, your medicines and it's controlled and you think your doctors think that, it's, that you have a long time to live, then it may be okay to do a mammogram every year or every two years. But I think it, that does bring up a great question um, to kind of keep those kind of uh, competing risks um, kind of a decision about that. So I think if a, a person in that category said, you know, I don't really want to do mammograms anymore, I think our team, our oncologists and, and surgeons would probably say that that's probably reasonable since you're being seen um, for the metastatic breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, I think, is there a time um, if you were well and 80, would you stop doing mammograms? Yeah, I think there's a different consensus from different places, just, just like we were talking about. I think, it, and as we all know, there are different 80-year-olds um, across uh, the city, the state, the country. So um, for an 80-year-old woman that's very healthy and has a, a family that lives longer and is expected to live another 10 years, I think it, it's probably okay to maybe to do a mammogram every other year for the next, you know, four or five years, six years. Um, if that person has significant other health issues, maybe he's had a heart attack in the past or is at a high risk for a stroke or has poor health, then it's probably not um, uh, an important aspect. So I think usually people say that if the life expectancy is at least 10 years, that, um, that they would consider continuing the mammography, the mammograms. We rarely do mammograms in patients who have metastatic disease, just to emphasize what Michael had already said about if you're already being treated with Zolota for metastatic disease, it's highly unlikely that something you can't feel on exam is gonna make any impact on your survival or quality of life. Um, and uh, so we don't get them unless somebody, you know, is has a very unusual situation. Um, sometimes we have patients who do have metastatic HER2 positive disease 
who are uh, living decades and decades and you know are young still and so we'll image but it's it's really the exception rather than the rule um and then michael if somebody had radiation uh and can they get it again so can the same location have more than two times radiation yeah so there are some newer techniques and it depends on what type of radiation and how much the per radiation the person had previously. Um, our radiation oncologists um, are starting to do re-irradiation um, and with specific techniques so that a patient could have potentially a, uh, a second round of radiation. And, and as uh, Dr. Rugo knows and the rest of the panelists, the radiation also has changed dramatically in terms of instead of you know, every day for five weeks, and then now every day for three weeks, and now potentially once a week uh, for for five weeks, um, partial breast irradiation, intraoperative radiation therapy. So there really are a, a number of, of possibilities. And I think we really wanted to bring this up, um, not because everybody is going to be eligible for a second radiation, but we wanted to bring it up so that at least the um, people that are here on the panel or, or that are, are attending, or if you have friends or family, at least they can ask and they can, they can ask the question and they may actually be um, a candidate for a second time of radiation. And then do you, you know, there's um, the 3D mammography and everything, and there's some uh, concern that, that it means you have extra radiation exposure, but it doesn't really help you. No, the, the 3D mammography or the tomosynthesis um, is an extremely low dose of radiation. Um, um, and I would, would not be worried about that at all in terms of uh, risk. Um, and it works very well for some patients and for other patients, it's not even necessary. Again, it does depend on the breast size, the breast density and whether 3D or also known as tomosynthesis would be even beneficial for every person. So I think the new technique somebody's asking about is tomosynthesis, but um, somebody said, um, what year did it change that having radiation a second time was possible after having had a lumpectomy and radiation previously? Does it depend on the cancer center? <laughs> Who uh, answered that, Michael? <laughs> yeah, it, I think it definitely does depend on the cancer center and the, the cancer treating physicians and at, at what time point. Um, again, I think it, it, I think as Dr. Rugo would attest to and the rest of the panelists is that we feel that shared decision-making with our patients is extremely important and weighing both the risks and benefits. Um, and some physicians in different parts of the country um, aren't as open to making shared decisions based on what patients really want to do. And so it, it has been evolving, I'd say, you know, that's probably in the last five to six years that it's been more of an option for a second type of radiation. But again, it comes potentially with a slightly higher risk of a local recurrence compared to what you would get as a general first time breast cancer surgery. So there are some trade-offs and it's something that usually should be discussed with the radiation oncologist and your surgeon and oncology team at the same time. That's great, really helpful. Um, so uh, I think it's actually, you know, this is uh, and actually as, um, as um, I think uh, Michael and I have discussed, you know, there are situations where, you know, I might be worried about a patient having, um, uh, needing to have a mastectomy or uh, because of the high risk of the cancer. And we do a lot of discussing about this, so. Um, and um, the last question, because I want to get on to our exercise part, is does bilateral mastectomy reduce your recurrence rate to less than 10%? So, um, so, that, that it, so it would kind of depend on what type of cancer you had, how large the cancer was, whether or not your lymph nodes were involved. But as a general rule, if you have your lymph nodes are negative and you have an average risk or low risk breast cancer. So estrogen positive, the HER2 or HER2 negative, lymph nodes negative, grade one or grade two. With the mastectomy, the risk of that cancer coming back in that area is usually less than 2%. And if you had a mastectomy on the other side, 
your risk of having a, another breast cancer or that breast cancer coming back would be as low as one or 2%. However, as Dr. Rugo knows and the rest of the panelists, unfortunately, there are women that have high risk breast cancers that have a number of lymph nodes involved or a positive lymph node or some other characteristics. And then you start thinking about, well, lumpectomy with radiation may have the same risk compared to mastectomy with radiation. So these are the discussions that, that uh, the panelists and myself uh, and have with our patients about, about do you, it sounds like mastectomy is gonna be much, much better because it's more aggressive, but based on the type of breast cancer, it may not be that much beneficial to you um, to do that. And then again, there are other discussions about, am I gonna to have to have screening or not screen? So, but I think um, a general rule for a lower risk breast cancer, that's lymph node negative, the risk of it coming back after mastectomy is probably in the two percent range. Great, thank you very much. So let's jump into uh, talking about exercise and also baby town with Natalie. In that area I think we're all really interested in. Can we get sick hormone therapy with less side effects for prevention? Um, and what can we do about exercise? Now, let me just figure out how to uh, get it to go. Hmm. It's not working, there we go. Um, sorry guys, I'm like technically challenged here. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, Baby Tam and tamoxifen is used, it's used to treat or invasive disease and it's uh, to decrease the risk of invasive disease. And then there's the use of tamoxifen for prevention. And um, we usually in the past have used 20 milligrams of tamoxifen for five years. And that would be the standard uh, use in the preventive setting. And the women that we consider for prevention um, treatment are people who have high risk of breast cancer. And so that would be people that have maybe atypical ductal hyperplasia or what they call lobular carcinoma in situ. These are lesions that are found on biopsy. Maybe a patient has an abnormal mammogram and they do a biopsy and find these lesions that are not cancer, but they are markers for an increased risk of breast cancer. And then also in people that have uh, non-invasive cancer DCIS. And so uh, baby TAM is a, a study that looked at using low dose tamoxifen, only five milligrams a day rather than 20 milligrams a day and only three years of treatment versus five years of treatment. Um, and so the, the primary endpoint was incidence of invasive breast cancer or DCIS. Um, they had 500 patients enrolled and this was uh, done in Italy. Sorry, I'm... Okay. Um, so this, these were the subjects and the tumor characteristics. Um, so in the baby TAM, well, in both groups, their, their average age was uh, 54. About 45% or so were premenopausal. Um, and then it shows the, the incidence of ADH and LCIS and DCIS. And something to note um, in this trial is that around 40% or 39% of patients um, had not had radiation um, after DCIS, lumpectomy for DCIS. So that that's, um, you know, would increase their risk of local recurrence compared to if they would have had radiation. So in, um, in this uh, study, what they showed is that for all breast events, um, either invasive events or DCIS, um, when people took baby TAM, so just five milligrams, uh, it reduced the risk by about 52% uh, to get any breast event at all. Um, and then there's the, the second part of prevention, which is to decrease the risk of breast cancer on the other side and lower the risk of a second breast cancer. And this was about a 75% re risk reduction in the other side, uh, getting a cancer on the other side. Um, so one of the side effects, or actually two of the serious side effects of tamoxifen are uh, some type of thrombotic event, like a pulmonary embolus or a DVT, or endometrial cancer. And in the baby TAM group versus placebo, there was really no difference in the um, incidence. Um, there was one endometrial cancer in the baby TAM group, 
Um, and there was, it would have been expected with 20 milligrams of tamoxifen for 2.7 um, patients to get uh, endometrial cancer um, compared to this lower rate of endometrial cancer. And the, the thrombotic event, events were the same in the baby TAM group versus the placebo. Um, the other thing that uh, is is the, the side effects um, that people get from hormone blockers. So um, when patients have hormone blockade, they, they can get hot flashes, and it's oftentimes why they will stop taking tamoxifen. In the preventive setting, there's really no change in overall survival. So a lot of people are scared of side effects, and they don't take it for prevention, or they have side effects, and they stop it. But in this um, graph, you can see on the left that it was pretty much equal the placebo and, and baby TAM, maybe slightly more hot flashes, but not, not really statistically significant. Whereas you can see a really big difference on the right between um, 20 milligrams of tamoxifen and placebo. So I wanna just briefly touch on exercise, which is one of my favorite things to talk about to my cancer patients and just lifestyle modifications. And um, Melinda Irwin, who's a, a, a person who's done a lot of research. Um, she's at Yale and she's done a lot of research on lifestyle and decreasing cancer risk. And um, she had a talk and I'm going to present some of the data from her talk and kind of what it means for cancer patients. Um, she was talking about the rationale for studying obesity and cancer outcomes and also lifestyle uh, modifications in cancer outcomes. And there's a 29% drop in cancer mortality rates since the peak in 1991, but we're worried that this decline in cancer mortality might be offset by the rise in obesity and then the risk of cancer caused by obesity or by lifestyle factors. Um, so about 40% of adults um, in the United States have a BMI of greater than 30. And this is a six fold increase in obesity since the 1970s. So 14 cancers are associated with obesity and 13 cancers are associated with low physical activity. So these are all the cancers that are, that are kind of associated with obesity, breast cancer being one of them and colorectal, but there are 14 different types that are um, associated with obesity. Um, in the preventive setting, um, there are 13 different cancers that if you exercise, they, it lowers the risk of getting 13 different kinds of, of cancers out of 26 that they studied. And this uh, exercise is just following the physical activity guidelines of, of Americans, which is about three hours a week of moderate, moderate exercise um, or a, an hour and a half of intense exercise like running. So these are three lifestyle factors that are modifiable. And the, they are also three things that, that have a very high um, rate of mortality related to the behavior. So low physical activity increases your risk of dying. It, high body mass index, it, which is a surrogate for obesity. It's not a perfect surrogate, but it's, but it's what they, you know, that's how they decide whether someone's overweight in, in studies. Um, and then dietary risk. So uh, different kinds of dietary patterns increasing the risk of cancer and death. And how our lifestyle behaviors cause cancer is that our fat cells can make estrogens and different chemicals that can cause inflammation. Um, it also can um, cause, we can have insulin resistance because of being obese or from having diabetes or, or type two diabetes, especially. We can have um, insulin resistance from what we eat and we can also have insulin resistance from low muscle mass. So insulin is a, a direct risk factor for, oh, sorry, I'll go back here. It's a direct risk factor for recurrence, and it's also a direct risk factor for death uh, from breast cancer. And that's insulin, resting insulin in the blood. And if you exercise, you lower your uh, insulin level, and you de it decreases the risk of recurrence in people with breast cancer. Strength training uh, builds muscle mass, and this lowers insulin the most of any type of exercise. It lowers it up to five times as much as regular exercise like walking. So that's why we recommend strength training for patients. And this is, this is a meta-analysis of different exercise studies that have been done, 
And when you look at this graph the, at the one in the middle, anything to the left of the graph is showing a decreased risk of breast cancer specific mortality. So exercise has been shown in many trials to decrease the risk of dying from breast cancer. So these are the different things that we kind of have control over that we can, can do. And following a healthy diet pattern across our lifespan is important. Um, focusing on like a variety of different foods, um, eating nutritious foods that are uh, not full of empty calories. So that would be like not eating too much sugar or uh, processed foods, more fruits and vegetables, more fiber, limiting calories from added sugars, Sugary drinks have been associated with an increased risk of cancer and breast cancer is one of those cancers that increases the risk. And so limiting sugar is uh, good because it lowers insulin when you don't eat sugar and shifting to healthier choices um, at school, work and home. And then exercising um, three hours a week or 75 minutes a week um, of intense exercise or 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. That would be like walking at a pace where you can talk, but you can't sing. Or if you're running, that would be, and you can't really talk because you're, you're exerting yourself intensely, you can do half as much exercise to get the benefit. Uh, something I like to say to my patients though, is if you can't meet these guidelines, that's okay. Doing any exercise at all will decrease your risk and it will help you with side effects. And it will also, any kind of movement, any kind of exercise compared to none is beneficial. And this is the last slide I'm going to do because of the sake of time, but um, this was a randomized controlled trial of diet and exercise in women who did not have cancer. And it showed that if they, if they did exercise at those levels and followed a, a healthy diet, um, their insulin levels dropped by 24% and their inflammation in their body dropped by 41%. This was a, a study by McTiernan. Um, who's done a lot of research on exercise and cancer risk. So I'll unshare for now because I'm probably over time, I think. Yeah, I think, um, but what, I think this is a topic we should keep talking about um, and we'll at our next forum too, if we can grab Natalie's time. I think this is so important because um, we're, uh, you know, really talking about risk reduction that we can take some control over, I think. Um, uh, Kelly Shanahan brings up a, a very active physician and advocate that um, this is really more risk reduction than, you know, classified as rather than prevention. But um, I think this is really important to talk about and really helpful to give these specific um, recommendations, although we might even need them to be more specific. You know, it's just 150 minutes of exercise. always been a little perplexing to me, but uh, as I sit at the Zoom computer uh, all day when I'm not in clinic, and clinic isn't that far, you know, walk in so short, to, <laughs> like maybe I should walk back and forth more. So, uh, well, actually, one thing that I like to tell people is to do like exercise snacks, like to to do 10 air squats or to do 10 push-ups on the table or the wall or the floor, whatever you can do. Like just taking breaks and getting some, some exercise in somehow or go for a five minute walk. If you can't go for 30 minutes, then go for five. That's better than none. Yes. Yeah, so that, I mean, it's kind of like thinking about endocrine therapy. It's better to take something than nothing. A little exercise is better than none. Uh, <laughs> uh, jumping up and down or, you know, walking back and forth while you're watching te television is even okay. Um, I think the one really great question from Kelly was, uh, can you discuss the paradox that obesity early in life seems to decrease the risk of breast cancer while postmenopausal obesity increases the risk? Well, it's actually kind of interesting, and, and you probably know more about this than me, Hope, but that being overweight also is not such a risk factor in premenopausal breast cancer compared to postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, and I think that the, the, the mechanisms of insulin resistance as you age, it's not just that you have fat cells with them making estrogen for you. It's not just that. It's, it's insulin resistance. It's how it affects the tumor microenvironment and how, how those different cytokines talk to, the, talk to the cancer cell. And when you're younger, you actually oftentimes have more muscle mass, even if you're overweight. If you're older, you're developing sarcopenia, which is lower muscle mass as you age. And so that may be the difference why younger people who are obese don't have the same kind of risk or outcome as older people who 
maybe aren't even as obese, but they may have lower muscle mass, which we know is an independent risk factor for, for mortality with cancer. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, you think about stored estrogen forever, right? And if maybe when you're in menopause, when you have a lot of uh, obesity, you're really storing so much more estrogen because those cells are what's making estrogen, whereas otherwise it's your ovaries when you're younger. So uh, right. you're storing it in fat. It's not such a big difference. And so it doesn't make a difference as much. Something that's also really interesting about that is the way that estrogen is metabolized in the gut. Because, you know, they're, they're studying the microbiome and all these the Be Well trial, they're studying it. And also the leaner trial, they're studying the microbiome of women with breast cancer because how you metabolize estrogen and maybe reabsorb estrogen out of the gut with your microbiome is maybe has an, an influence on that. And that may be different when you're younger versus when you're older. Um, and then somebody else is somebody who's a big exercise enthusiast. Um, asks and it has a rib fracture. It asks, is there such a thing as too much exercise? <laughs> yes, there actually is. And I, I, I find this to be really interesting. If you look at the, if you look at the, the benefit of exercise, the people that get the most benefit are go from doing nothing to something. And then the curve starts to come down and it seems like the sweet spot somewhere between 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 to 150 minutes of intense exercise. When you go past that, there's no benefit for patients beyond that. And in fact, if you overtrain, you can raise your cortisol level in your blood and that can raise your insulin level. And so people that overtrain can actually do harm to themselves metabolically. So there is there, you can overtrain and do too much exercise and actually hurt yourself. Now that that's not, the case with most Americans. They're not usually <laughs> over exercising. That might be true for somebody like you who's like a you know a serious enthusiast, but you know, most people are not over exercising, at least my patients are. No, I think that one of the issues is if you're really pushing hard at exercise and you can really, you know, you could actually hurt yourself. And you know, people who run forever end up with more, you know, joint problems and um, et cetera. Now, if you're Dr. Alvarado and you bike, as long as you stay on that bike, you should be uh, safer. So, he's Plus, big. that's relaxing him. He's riding, right. he's all getting all relaxed. Put <laughs> clipped in, you like all those people around you. Anyway, <laughs> but um, the um, 150 minutes and Dr. Hubbard bikes. Um, and the last question is, is that 150 minutes a day or 300 minutes a day or week? Oh, no, I, I really should clarify this. <laughs> it's 150 minutes a week. Yeah. So 30 minutes a day of walking. Day. <laughs> or, or you could do 75 minutes a week of intense exercise, like running or swimming, riding a bike quickly. Right. Yeah, that's good. Excellent. Well, so uh, the weather's gotten better, so people can swim. We are a little safer, so that's good. I want to really thank everybody, Melody, for organizing everything. It's been fabulous, and uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a bunch of other questions, you know, weight training, et cetera. We'll definitely talk about this more, so sign into our next forum, and we'll keep a little bit, I hope, for exercise in most of our forums. We can talk a little bit about specific activities, which I think Natalie can really give us a lot of great suggestions about having organized an app just for this purpose um, and a community of discussion, which is great. Um, so I think that'll be a nice discussion for our next forum, which is June 16th, as you know. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the people who are on now. I think we, uh, Teresa had to go, but uh, she did a great job. Uh, Michael Alvarado for mentoring her and helping organize this. Laura for spending a lot of time making beautiful pictures about immunotherapy and how it works, really nice cartoons. And uh, Natalie, as always, for her tremendous help and, uh, and participating in the forum. Uh, so uh, remember that we have uh, this information is recorded and uh, uh, Melody will send out uh, the link to the recording to the email list so that you can listen to anything again. Uh, and uh, that link, we often also send by tweet, so it will be available to you. Uh, we have a Twitter handle, right, Melody? Um, yeah, and it's uh, UCSF uh, Breast Forum. 
Great. So our Twitter handle, UCSF Breast Forum. And uh, again, that helps. And the uh, link is there, uh, cancer.ucsf.edu slash forum. Uh, so all the information is there. And you can also message uh, Melody, as you know, and add people to our email list is really easy. So. Um, and uh, just the last thing that popped up was, are, uh, are you saying, Natalie, that more than 300 hours of exercise a week increases your cancer risk? Uh, I don't think you were saying that. Um, yeah, you no, I'm just saying that I'm just saying that you can overtrain and it's not necessarily good for your body metabolically. Right. But I'm not yeah. saying if you exercise, you're going to get an increased risk of cancer. What I was saying, though, is that there doesn't seem to be an extra benefit past that 300 minutes. So you're not getting an extra cancer protection if you do it longer. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so wonderful. Thanks again, everybody. Great. Thank form. you. Hope. Fabulous. And uh, we thanked uh, Dr. Uh, Aurora, who uh, since she does heme malignancies, I let her go and uh, in their blood cancers. So thanks again, everyone. Take care, uh, be safe and have a great uh, rest of your week and weekend. Talk to you in June. Bye. Bye. Bye.